are we enabling unapproved therapies? By doing this, do we, is it the camel's nose under the tent? I mean, you know, we have a lot of questions to ask. Well, they're going on. I mean, yes, it is happening place. Place. ads. If you've got any of these things mm -hmm. show up in the hotel room, um, right. on Sunday morning and we've got a cure. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of people who are at the end of their rope in terms of their well, health. Is so Senator more? Ingman has oh, a question sorry. and then Senator McCormick, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, Jen, I was wondering, have you ever seen in, in statute something that specifies like when consent has to, has to be given? Because, you know, like, I've had procedures in hospitals and that and I'm like you know I'm not in any I, they even take my glasses off so I can't read what I'm signing you know but they, it's like why didn't they give this to me you know sooner is, is there ever anything that actually specifies like it has to be done you know a certain period of time before you're, you're actually you actually show up medicated. for the yeah medicated and, <laughs> not that I'm aware of other seen? than it, you know it would go to your sort of capacity to provide informed yeah. consent depending on when it was in the process and there could be some professional I think professional liability issues there mm -hmm. um, but otherwise so we don't specify all that it has to be in the doctor's office we could look office. at doing that right we could certainly look at doing that yeah okay All right. thank you so what uh, Senator McCormick go ahead there is a federal policy of right to try right people at the end with nothing to lose so we had looked at, at legislation on that in here. Yeah, before. that was my bill. Right. I got killed. On. And I, right, and I do think something may have been. I don't know whether people were tracking it more. May have been enacted at the federal. Yeah, level. no, the feds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. Right. So this wouldn't say you can't do it. This would say there has to be certain notice, informed consent, and advertising requirements yeah. around that. So it's already allowed. This doesn't allow it. Implicitly. Right, right. So it's happening. This is right. So my understanding is that these are happening now. What? Whether these are the same, yeah. um, same products that are being used in, under Rate right. to Try, I don't know. So um, I, I guess um, the question for me is: Will there will be someone talking with us about FDA rules. And I, so, um, I think yes, Dr. Yes, Weiss yes. will. I mean, I, I have talked with him, okay. communicated with him, but just in case we don't get enough, we might want to, we might be looking to you for some help. Okay. But, but don't, this. Thank you. don't overdo it. Okay. Okay. All right. So, and I think we had talked about those actually in the context of the right to try bill in the yes, past about kind of the different stages of clinical trials and that kind of stuff. So I can yeah. dust off that. Okay. Um, anything else on that, Bill? So we'll look forward to Valentine's Day. Now we have something to look forward to. That's 252. Like long stemmed red roses. Right, long stemmed, stemmed red roses. Slow, Slow stem. <laughs> 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 that was really stem bad. <laughs> long stem cells. Long uh, stem cells. It yeah. doesn't sound like a good trade. You no, know, it doesn't. Uh, okay. All right, so we'll move on to S288. And um, so we're going to look at the bill that uh, the proposal of um, the amendments that Jen has, and then Nolan also has. I have a copy of the fiscal note. Do you, do you, I mean, I can. I think we should do it after we have the bill walk through because the bill's slightly different. I didn't but know you want to do it at all. Huh? I didn't know you wanted to do it. You don't have to. We'll just hand it out. We're not ready to do that yet. Okay. We're good. Experience. So S two eighty eight. Do we have yes. something new on that? You oh, should, yes. refresh your um, page. Yeah. It just went up. It's there. Okay. There it is. And that, so that's draft 1.3? Yes. All right. All right. All right. You know when you're in. Almost. I'll turn my page. <coughs> okay. 
All right, please. So this is S288, an act relating to banning flavored tobacco products and e-liquids. Um, this is a strike-all amendment with a lot of new language in it, so I've tried to identify kind of when the whole section is new and when a section was already in there, but I've made some changes to the language, so I've used bold and highlight for that. Um, there's a lot in here because I, as I was going through the tobacco statutes, it seems like there is currently not a lot of reference to, there are a lot of reference to tobacco substitutes, which are kind of the devices for e-cigarettes, but not a lot of reference to the liquids. As long as we're putting a definition in here, I was adding it in a bunch of places, but you may want to, they're, you know, you don't have to do them, you just have to know what you're choosing to do or not do. Um, so the first thing that I have is a findings section, and uh, this is based on um, findings that were, or, or some facts that were provided by some of the advocates. So do you want me to go through the findings? Yes. Okay. So this would have the General Assembly find that, first, tobacco use is costly. Vermont spends $348 million annually to treat tobacco-caused illnesses, including $87.2 million each year in Medicaid expenses. This translates into a tax burden each year of $759 per Vermont household. Productivity losses add an additional $232.8 million each year. Youth tobacco use is growing due to e-cigarettes. 7% of Vermont high school students smoke, but if e-cigarette use is included, 28% of Vermont youths use some form of tobacco product. More than one in four Vermont high school students now uses e-cigarettes. Use more than doubled among this age group from 12% to 26% between 2017 and 2019. More students report frequent use of e-cigarettes, which indicates possible nicotine addiction. According to the 2019 Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 31% of Vermont high school students, uh, high school e-cigarette users used e-cigarettes daily up from 15% in 2017. Flavored products are fueling the epidemic. 97% of youth e-cigarette users nationally reported in 2019 that they had used a flavored tobacco product in the last month, and 70% cited flavors as the reason for their use. E-cigarette and e-liquid manufacturers have marketed their products in youth-friendly flavors such as gummy bear, birthday cake, candy cane menthol, and bubble gum. Mint and menthol flavored e-cigarettes are increasing in popularity among youths. Over the past four years, mint and menthol went from being some of the least popular to being some of the most popular e-cigarette flavors among high school students. Evidence indicates that if any e-cigarette flavors remain on the market, youth will shift from one flavor to another. For example, after Juul restricted the availability of fruit, candy, and other e-cigarette flavors in retail stores in November 2018, Use of mint, mint and menthol e-cigarettes by high school users increased sharply, from 42.3% reportedly using mint and menthol e-cigarettes in 2017 to 63.9% using them in 2019. It is essential that menthol cigarettes are included in a ban on flavored tobacco products, flavored e-liquids, and flavored e-cigarettes to prevent youths who became addicted to nicotine through vaping from transitioning to traditional cigarettes. Menthol creates a cooling and numbing effect that reduces the harshness of cigarette smoke and suppresses the cough reflex. These effects make menthol cigarettes more appealing to young, inexperienced smokers, and research shows that menthol cigarettes are more likely to addict youth. Youth smokers are the age group most likely to use menthol cigarettes, but are also likely to quit if menthol cigarettes are no longer available. 54% of the youths, youths 12 to 17 years of age nationwide who smoke use menthol cigarettes. Nearly 65% of young menthol smokers say they would quit smoking if menthol cigarettes were banned. Eliminating the sale of menthol, cigarette, uh, menthol tobacco products promotes health equity. Menthol cigarette use is more prevalent among persons of color who smoke than among white persons who smoke and is more common among lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender smokers than among heterosexual smokers. 85% of African-American adult smokers use menthol cigarettes, and of black youths 12 to 17 years of age who smoke, seven out of 10 use menthol cigarettes. Tobacco industry documents show a concerted effort to target African-Americans through specific advertising efforts. The US Food and Drug Administration, FDA, agrees that menthol cigarettes harm the public health. 
In 2013, the FDA published a report concluding that removal of menthol cigarettes from the market would improve public health. And finally, Vermont cannot wait for the FDA to take action. The same federal legislation that was passed in 2019 banning all other flavored cigarettes allowed the, the FDA to regulate or ban menthol. Despite taking public comment on the dangers of menthol in 2013 and again in 2018, the FDA has still failed to act. The new policy released by the FDA on January 1, 2020 falls far short of protecting Vermonters from the dangers of smoking and nicotine addiction. The FDA's policy bans only flavored cartridge or pod-based e-cigarettes, and even then exempts those that are menthol or tobacco flavored. Open tank e-cigarettes and the flavored e-liquids used to fill them can still be sold, as can flavored, self-contained, disposable e-cigarettes. So, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, on line uh, uh, four, you said, uh, of that, of wait, where we are on that. Yeah, page. yeah. On, on page. Uh, okay, uh, four. four. Yep. Yeah, you said uh, 2019. I'm sorry. It says here 2009. Uh, 2009 which I just spoke. When 2009 spoke. is so correct. Two old, yes. Is correct. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Currently, I'm trying to go more modern, but yes, 2009 is is correct. So the federal legislation that was passed in 2009 um, banned flavored cigarettes other than menthol, but allowed the FDA to regulate or ban menthol. Okay. Thank you for the correction. Any questions on that? New, it's a new section. Right, it's a whole new section, so you have not seen that before. There's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. There is a lot. So my question is on the um, disposable e-cigarettes. There was a recent article in the New York Times indicating that disposable e-cigarettes was kind of a loophole for flavors. I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't, I, I won't right. characterize it's it. It's not, you can't characterize loophole, I understand yes, that. there is, right. Uh, right. So, so there are, my understanding is there are three different types of e-cigarettes. There is the, um, the ones that use the cartridges or pods. Those are the ones that are uh, that the FDA is taking enforcement action to ban uh, if they have not received pre-market approval. And then there are open tank e-cigarettes, so that's the kind where you can go into a shop and fill it, your, you know, or have it filled or fill it yourself. Um, and then there are the self-contained disposable e-cigarettes that's a one-time use and then you throw it out and those are available in flavors as well. You recycle it appropriately. You dispose of it appropriately. <laughs> but they are similar. I remember seeing the pictures and some examples. They're similar to the jewels. They're kind of cool. I'm, I'm thinking of the difference Standard between the tank things were not something you could use in school and not get caught. They're big, they're clunky, they're ugly. And they're expensive. And they're expensive and they look yeah, like your grandmother's clod hoppers. I mean, they're, they're, which is a different market. Right. But the disposable ones, they look like Pez dispensers. Right. And they were cute. Right. Hey, they're yeah. cute. All different yeah. colors. All right. Okay. So All right. That, that's that section. Right. We need so that's to the review that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can certainly modify as the committee chooses. Uh, so then we get into, I, I ended up just opening up all of chapter 40 in Title VII, which is the tobacco products chapter. Um, see, I'm realizing it should not be underlined. Um, so in the definitions section, um, I added. Can I, can I just ask you to introduce yourself to the committee, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Skylar Janess. I'm the Director of Compliance and Enforcement for the Department of Liquor and Lottery. So this is, I uh, thank you for being here. I know you, you, that we reached out to you and, and we appreciate your presence. So we're gonna be happy having to throw a, a line to a friend from time to time. So that's very good, thank you. You're very welcome. And, and feel free to raise your hand at any point so we can get the, your knowledge. Absolutely. Yes, and I did reach out to Mr. Janest yesterday with a couple of, but he's not seen the draft either. So, okay. you know, this Perfect. is perfect. All right. I'll be um, all right, so the first thing is in the, uh, I added in to make changes to the definition in the tobacco products chapter of tobacco products. And you'll see later, and this goes back to the issue we talked about last week about some sort of circularity and potential conflict 
in the definition of tobacco products in this chapter and the definition of other tobacco products in the tax statutes. Um, so in trying to decouple those from each other because they, they don't line up well, uh, I struck the language in the tobacco products statutes um, that, that gives kind of a catch-all for other tobacco products as defined in the tax statutes um, because those are both over and under inclusive of what we're referring to as tobacco products in these statutes. Um, so I also made changes then in the definitions in the uh, tax statutes and I have run this by the tax department which had some helpful um, suggestions that I've made in here. So, um, you know, obviously this is the first time people are, most people are seeing this, so it's possible that other changes need to be made. But I just took the language in the tax statute definition of other tobacco products um, and put it in here, the part that, that seems applicable and put it in here. So this would now say tobacco products means cigarettes, little cigars, roll your own tobacco, snuff cigars, new smokeless tobacco, this is all current law, and instead of saying, and other tobacco products as defined in the uh, tax statutes, it would use that, the language. And any other product manufactured from, derived from, or containing tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, by chewing, or in any other manner. So that's what the tax statute says. So that's, that so right that's part right of what now. the tax statute says. Then the tax statute gets into e-cigarette stuff, and then the tax statute says, it, it, but it doesn't include cigarettes, little cigars, roll your own tobacco, snuff cigars, and new smokeless tobacco, which this one says it does. That's how they were sort of conflicting. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that the tax statute says, other tobacco products means any product manufactured from, derived from, or containing tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, I mean, by, by chewing or in any other manner, and then it goes on to add the tobacco substitute stuff. So we're not really changing what's happening in the tax statutes for purposes of what is taxed under the tax statutes, but we are kind of decoupling them from each other. Um, and then in the definition of e-liquid, um, uh, the tax department had, I think, a helpful suggestion that, e that the liquid itself may be, something else may be happening to it other than heating. And in order to um, be sure we're capturing everything you intend to be capturing, this would add some language to make the definition e-liquid means the solution, substance, or other material used in or with a tobacco substitute that is heated or otherwise acted upon to produce an aerosol, vapor, or emission to be inhaled by the user, regardless of whether the liquid contains nicotine. I have two questions. Um, so we've heard recently that now that um, there is synthetic nicotine, so it's nicotine that is produced in the laboratory and not derived from tobacco. Does this cover that? Yeah, because this, okay. this says regardless of whether it contains nicotine, so it doesn't. My, my other question is kind of a basic question. It's a little stupid at this point, but how do you get it? What, what is the chemical reaction that causes the vapor to vaporize? Cause, so you're somebody's asking a lawyer that question? <laughs> <laughs> so just I'm throwing it out there because I, you know, I don't know that we've had that testimony. I'd like to know how that happens. Anyway, All you right. don't have to Everyone answer. Everyone else is on notice. All right. The E in the term E liquid uh, refer is short for electronic, yes. and the electronic effect is to eat. Well, let's, we don't use the electrons for anything else. Uh, so this is a term. I mean, you can call it anything you want. This seems to be a term that gets used a lot. So mm -hmm. I I uh, used it here. <coughs> But I suppose it could be acted upon in a way other than heating, which is where that could be a volcanic reaction. Right? It could be baking soda and something else. Right. Okay. But there's all kinds of aerosols. Yes. It could mm -hmm. be. Could be, yeah. Like modified. Right. Well, maybe we want to use the word aerosol. It is. Oh, it's, it's right there. It's there. It's there. It's six. To produce, they oh, yeah. produce an aerosol. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of. E liquid. I think e liquid is at this point a term of art. It came in to the jargon. Right. I mean, e liquids are sort of overall used with e cigarettes. We don't actually use that term 
statute either. We started with tobacco substitutes, and we've stuck with it. Okay. All right. You're descriptive. Yeah. will emit vapors before long. Descriptive grammar as opposed yeah. to prescriptive. All right. So then in section, existing section, so this is new to the bill, existing section um, 7 BSA 1002, this is the requirement to have uh, a license, that a retailer have a license to sell, retail, to sell um, various products at retail. And so I added, um, I added e-liquids in here because they had not specifically been captured in the licensure requirement. Um, and so I, we've talked, I think Senator Cummings has given an example in the past of somebody going to another state, coming back and selling um, these flavored products to their friends. And I said, no, because they don't even, you know, part, part of the issue is that they wouldn't have a license. And then I realized there isn't anything in the statute that specifically requires them to be licensed. So I added language in addition to um, not engaging in the retail sale of tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia without a tobacco license, I added e-liquids, um, I didn't put them under, I didn't refer to them specifically in the tobacco substitute endorsement piece that somebody has to have, and you, you can decide, you can decide with input from others whether that's appropriate, but to begin with, I thought I'd put it under the licensure requirement, um, and so then throughout, as we're talking about these other substances, um, I added e-liquid, and then similarly in subsection G, no person is allowed to, um, engage in the retail sale of these products unless they are a licensed wholesaler or acquire them from, or purchase them from a licensed wholesaler. And so in that section, based on language from added last year, uh, it had said substances containing nicotine or otherwise intended for use for the tobacco substitute, and I replaced that with the new e-liquids language. Then in section 1003, uh, I, as we had discussed doing last week, specifically added e-liquids to the ban on selling tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, and tobacco paraphernalia to anyone under 21 years of age. So everywhere those terms were used, I added um, e-liquids. I also noticed that in uh, subdivision C2A, where we have an existing exception about um, where <coughs> items can be displayed um, or stored that it did not include tobacco substitutes. So there, right now um, there is a requirement that someone holding a tobacco license may only display or store tobacco products or tobacco substitutes, and I've added or e and e-liquid, um, behind the sales counter or in any other area of the establishment that is inaccessible to the public or in a locked container. But then the, there's an exception uh, saying it doesn't apply to a display of, and it only says tobacco products located in, in a commercial establishment in which by law no person under 21 years of age is permitted to enter at any time. So it seemed appropriate to add tobacco substitutes there to be consistent with the requirement about where they can be displayed and stored. And if tobacco substitutes were added, it seemed appropriate to add e-liquids. So again, these are all things you can consider whether you think they're appropriate changes. Uh, I've left the rest of the language in just so you can see what else is in here, um, but it didn't make any changes. Page 8, section 1004, proof of age for the sale of tobacco products, tobacco <coughs> substitutes. I added e-liquids e and tobacco paraphernalia. So again, in existing law, somebody has to provide proper proof of age. Um, and if they don't provide proper proof of age, then the licensee is entitled to refuse to sell them, and so I added uh, e-liquids here as well. Then section 1005, persons under 21 years of age, possession of tobacco products, misrepresenting age, or purchasing, it's actually, now that I look at this, I think it's one thing I've been wanting to change, I believe it should be misrepresenting age for, Purchasing ah. tobacco products. Yes. Oh, I just will change that while we're in here. Uh -huh. good, um, good catch. So this is the prohibition on uh, a person under 21 years of age possessing, purchasing, or attempting to purchase um, these products, uh, e-liquids, unless they are a uh, holder of a tobacco license and are in possession of them to affect a sale in the course of employment. Um, and this is the $25 civil penalty. So again, I don't know if this would 
This would ban people, still ban people under 21 from uh, possessing e-liquids, whether or not they are flavored. Uh, last year you had put in, or in the past we had put in tobacco substitutes, so the devices themselves. So again, I've been adding e-liquids everywhere. The devices themselves were implicated, but wanted you to have an opportunity to hear from others on whether that was as intended. Posting of signs. Section 1006, a person uh, licensed under this chapter or retailer must post in a conspicuous place um, a warning sign that the sale of various products, this would add e-liquids to persons under 21 years of age is prohibited. Then on page 10, section 1007, furnishing tobacco to persons under 21 years of age and report. This again is adding um, a penalty to a person who sells or furnishes tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, adding e-liquids or tobacco paraphernalia to someone under 21 years of age um, and has the, um, still directs the Division of Liquor Control to do compliance testing. There were some changes to the um, license suspensions last year for multiple violations. And then in subdivision three on page 11 and looking at this, um, the, the divisions report, the Division of uh, Liquor Control and the Department of Liquor and Lottery, their compliance report goes to certain committees. It does not go to this committee, so I wanted to flag that in case you wanted to add yourselves and your house counterpart. Right now it goes only to the uh, House General Housing and Military Affairs and the Senate Economic Development Housing and General Affairs Committee. And then I noted that um, the Tobacco Evaluation and Review Board last year was folded into the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council, so I swapped those out. Um, but you can think about whether you want this committee and the Human Services Committee to receive this um, compliance testing report or just know that it's out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is, with this obviously will have to be reviewed by economic development. Um, well, the only change to this other than the, the name of the um, council that's getting the report is adding the um, compliance testing and, mm -hmm. um, and prohibition right. on, or, or penalty um, for e-liquids as well as right. I, I don't see it as a big review. I see it as a look through. All right. Uh -huh. Then section 109, and I labeled this with the question keep because it had been in the earlier versions, um, but I think there had been some discussion about whether it should stay in or not, and this is one of the things I um, reached out to the Department of Liquor and Lottery about, um, is uh, adding, so under current law, any cigarettes or other tobacco products that have been sold, offered for sale, or possessed for sale in violation of section 1003, which is the sale of um, tobacco products to uh, minors and some other other requirements for retailers. Um, any anything that was sold, offered for sale, or possessed for sale in violation of that statute and some other statutes um, throughout the green books. And any commercial cigarette rolling machines possessed or used in violation of Section 1011 um, are deemed contraband and subject to seizure by the Commissioner of Liquor Lottery or their agents or employees, the Commissioner of Taxes or agents or employees or law enforcement <coughs> officer when directed to do so by the Commissioner. And those um, items would be cigarettes. Um, oops, we lost some straight through. Um, uh, all items seized under this subsection would be destroyed. So I added that this would apply not only to, to cigarettes and other tobacco products, but tobacco substitutes, e-liquids, and tobacco paraphernalia. Um, so that's um, certainly broader than existing law, but, but a lot of the provisions have already been added to some of those statutes. Um, and then added also section 1010, which is the internet sales provision that we've worked on last year, um, and 1013, which is the new flavor ban. So and it's some expansion in the contraband and seizure statute, um, and I, there was not much testimony on this, but what there was, I think, suggested that maybe it shouldn't stay, and I think the department may have thoughts on whether it should be in or not, that I will let them speak to. And you're talking specifically about 1009? Yes. Okay. Top of page 12. So we'll, we'll hear from the department on Great. that. Great. Um, internet sales, I added into um, this statute. This is the one that you 
uh, you, the legislature, and I think to some extent this committee looked at it last year with respect to internet sales and mail order sales of um, all of the cigarettes and tobacco products and tobacco substitutes. Um, so last year's language said substances containing nicotine or otherwise intended for use with a tobacco substitute. We just struck that language and substituted or replaced it with e-liquids. Um, and then at the end of that section, um, under violations of the section of the punishment and allowing the Attorney General to impose a civil penalty, um, I realized that in last year's language, um, I didn't update the, uh, the piece that talks about each shipment or transport of cigarettes, roll your own tobacco, little cigars, or snuff to include tobacco substitutes, e-liquids, or tobacco paraphernalia constituting a separate violation. So I added that language in there. Um, I skipped over section 1011 because it relates to, to cigarette rolling machines and wasn't relevant to what you're working on in this bill. It didn't seem it to me. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The previous section. So, um, so this prohibits uh, like individual sales on online, but, but it can be sold to a wholesale one? Right. It, okay. Right. So, yeah, so nobody um, can cause these items under, and this is a, as you enacted last year, nobody can cause any of these items uh, ordered or purchased by mail or online or by telephone or other electronic network to be shipped to anyone other than a licensed wholesaler or retailer. Section 1012, my note here is add e-liquids. I didn't make any changes in this section because I didn't want to get into changing it if you were not interested, but this is an existing section of statute um, talking about liquid nicotine and saying uh, basically require child-resistant packaging for any um, liquid or gel substance containing nicotine and any nicotine liquid container. Um, and then we have definitions of uh, child-resistant packaging and nicotine liquid container. So I this could read with the gum and... No, this is liquid specifically. Okay, liquids. What, what is liquid nicotine? It's, it's a, uh, the e-liquids that have nicotine in them. Okay. So it's sort of a subset. So it's the question. The bottles. It's all the right. Right. It's all the right. bottles. All right. It's not the patches. And, no. All right. So my question for you on this is, do you want me to revise this language to apply to all e-liquids, whether or not they contain nicotine, or I could make it use our definition of e-liquids but specify nicotine? It seems like it might be a good idea to have consistent definition or consistent language throughout. Um, but I didn't want to start monkeying with it without you having an opportunity to give me some direction on whether and to what extent you want to change it. If we're banning them. Well, you're not banning we're, all of them. You're not banning, banning flavors. To say, we're all, all right, so it's just, so it would be the one, the only thing left is straight tobacco. Yes, once we get to the next section, yes. Or no cannabis. You know, That's not in touching here. that. Uh, Hemp and cannabis, you can smoke all you want, and right now they're not affected. Let THC. Uh, I know the bill doesn't come down. Right. I mean, I think liquid, <laughs> liquid cannabis would be, or, or um, things that are going to be baked would be captured in the definition of e-liquid, but they're not in your necessarily in your flavor. You can't bake definitions. You what? You can't bake them unless you are doing it through. You might want to look at when we're doing this because we had to exempt um, when we did the tax, the um, dispensaries, which vaping is the delivery system of choice for many people at the dispensaries. Right. Do you want to make sure you're so, not so specifically, Jen, you are. the question is on section 1012, mm -hmm. and the question is whether or not to include what in this section. The question is really, should I should I this amend section. this section to use the e-liquid language? Okay. And if so, do you want it specific to e-liquids containing nicotine or all of them? And who is going to be able to help us with this besides ourselves? I don't have an answer for that. I think we'll be on help. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. 
mean, I think, okay. it, I think it makes sense to be consistent with your terminology throughout the yeah. chapter as long as we don't lose the meaning. Um, but but I think the the particular policy question would yeah. be: Do you want this just? Do you want childproof packaging just for mm -hmm. substances containing nicotine or any e-liquids? Okay. Just e-liquids containing nicotine or yes. All right, and then we have section uh, 1013, which is the one we looked at last time, um, which is really kind of what, why the bill, you brought the bill forward in the first place. Um, and this is the ban on flavored tobacco products, flavored tobacco substitutes, and flavored e-liquids. So it has the definitions. Didn't make any changes to the definitions of characterizing flavor, flavored e-liquid, flavored tobacco product, or flavored tobacco substitute. Um, and it still prohibits the sale, uh, anyone from selling, offering for sale, giving, providing, and transporting, manufacturing, or otherwise distributing one or more flavored tobacco products, flavored e-liquids, or flavored tobacco substitutes. Uh, I took out the language that you had asked to take out um, that would ban possession, possession purchase or attempt to purchase of uh, flavored tobacco products, flavored e-liquids, or flavored tobacco substitutes. Um, so could I still vape cannabis? So I'm not it's not tobacco. Right, I'm not familiar enough with the cannabis there are no laws. laws. But okay, then um, no you can. if you grew it yourself, you right. can vape <laughs> <laughs> it. I suppose I could also share it with a friend at THC. <laughs> so okay. The good good question we'll also ask DLL. Uh, Skylar, that question as well. Um, and then you had asked to put in the same penalty provision that we have for um, somebody who uh, sells to someone underage. So this has a person who violates this section shall be subject to a civil penalty of not more than $100 for a first offense, not more than $500 for any subsequent offense. And the action would be brought in the same manner as for a traffic violation. Um, at the Judicial Bureau and brought within 24 hours of the occurrence. Um, and then you'll see that next section, section three is new. It would add um, th these violations to the Judicial Bureau's jurisdiction. So violations of that ban relating to flavored tobacco products, flavored bean liquids, and flavored tobacco substitutes. Um, then I added, the rest of them are kind of some conforming changes, adding e-liquids in places where it also seemed like they should be. So uh, the next one is an existing provision um, in Title VII talking about um, the penalty provisions in the alcoholic beverages section or rest of the, of the title and saying that the provisions of that penalty section don't apply to a violation of subsection 1005A relating to the purchase of tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, I added e-liquids or tobacco paraphernalia by a person under age 21. Um, so then in section five, this was as I was trying to think about what, uh, where, where you might have unintentional exceptions remaining in the statutes. Under current law, uh, it is prohibited to use tobacco products and tobacco substitutes on public school grounds and at public school sponsored functions. Uh, so I thought perhaps it would make sense to add e-liquids here as well. Generally you're using them in combination with a tobacco substitute, um, but it would seem like it presented a fuller picture of the, of the prohibition. Um, I added in the, the uh, charge and creation of the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. This is one you worked on, I think, with KE last year that folded a few different boards and councils together. Uh, one of their charges uh, has to do with looking at uh, all substances at risk of misuse, including tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, uh, and under current law, and substances containing nicotine or that are otherwise intended for use with a tobacco substitute. So I um, added and e liquids, and then those all get modified by that as defined in 7 BSA section 1001. We're almost done. Um, then we have the tax. Um, this is the, the definitions for the cigarette and other tobacco tax statutes in Title 32. So this is the part I was alluding to earlier where I tried to clean up the definitions. Um, so this would have in the definition of other tobacco products, 
What? Sorry. Um, the definition of other question. tobacco products um, under our existing law, it's any product manufactured from, derived from, from, or containing tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, I added by, by chewing, or in any other manner. And then it goes on to say, including products sold as a tobacco substitute, which themselves don't really contain tobacco, um, and including any liquids, again, don't contain tobacco. So I thought it was better to stop there and then say, new sentence, the term also includes products sold as a tobacco substitute, as defined in 7 BSA 1018, um, and then use the e-liquid language instead of including any liquids, whether nicotine-based or not. So e-liquids, as defined in 7 BSA 1001-9, and delivery devices sold separately for use with a tobacco substitute or e-liquid. The tax department suggested that or e-liquid part. Um, and then the existing law goes on to say, but shall not include cigarettes, little cigars, roll your own tobacco, snuff, or new smokeless tobacco, as defined in this section. All right, then we had that um, report a study and report directive to the Attorney General's office. By December 1st, the Office of the Attorney General would report to various committees, including this one, regarding whether and to what extent Vermont may re legally restrict advertising and regulate the content of labels, you talked about adding last time, for electronic cigarettes and other vaping-related products in this state. And then finally, the effective date, as um, as introduced, would take a, the bill would take effect on passage. I don't know if that works for you or if you want to set, um, it makes sense to set a date certain so there's predictability for the retailers. Yes, I think the latter. I mean, we, we've, we've done that previously. Right. I think we'll just have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Your short bill turned into a 20, potentially 20 page bill. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you so much for going through and, and doing, this You're is welcome. a huge amount of work and I, um, we, we appreciate it helps us think. And I don't know if you know the whole committee, but I we're... I didn't see your introductions earlier. Oh, that's good. Okay, that's great. So, um, a, a lot of this is being suggested as a, a new f to the bill, and there are there's the one specific area, that's the 1009, uh, whether we should keep that section or not, and then the rest of it. So, um, Why don't we let you introduce yourself and sure. then go ahead. Sure. Uh, again, my name is Skylar Genest. I'm the director of the Office of Compliance and Enforcement for the Vermont Department of Liquor and Lottery. Um, my office uh, does have the enforcement authority of the department to enforce all of our laws and regulations regarding uh, tobacco products germane uh, to the discussion today. We also oversee alcohol <coughs> and uh, lottery, and some small elements of gambling. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak uh, to the proposal. And I also appreciate Ms. Garvey's work to uh, align a lot of the definitions. Uh, we operated a little bit in some uh, nebulous areas between what the tax definition were of these products and what our Title VII definition was. So we certainly appreciate the, the parity uh, between the two codes there. Uh, in regards to 1009, Right, so let's find that again. Sure. Um, it's on page. as proposed is important uh, to amend Title VII to allow that authority, uh, particularly when we talk about abandoning a substance, uh, becomes very challenging enforcement-wise if we don't necessarily have the, thing, uh, the authority to seize those contraband products. Uh, historically, we've relied on the tax uh, title, Title 32, to, uh, because it had this cleaner verbiage on 
our authority to seize contraband. Um, so 1009 is proposed. We are we would be fully in support of amending that statute uh, to include these e-liquid definitions, uh, a new a new definition. We were uh, luckily not faced with any of the opportunities proposed by the current current statute, um, but we could we we did contemplate what it would mean if we were asked to seize a tobacco substitute but not necessarily sees uh, only liquid form. These, again, the, the Title VII definition as it sits now uh, tends to identify the device in particular and not necessarily the substances that go into the device. So by adding the definition of this e-liquid, uh, e uh, it, it certainly extends that authority to see that as contraband should, should the ban pass. Okay, questions on that? Uh, what, well, I guess what what happens to them once they're seized? Are you a commissioner? Director. 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 Chief. Just go ahead. What happens to them once they're seized? Uh, they're, they're they're warehoused in our evidence room, uh, 13 Green Mountain Drive in Montpelier. On a, on a a rolling basis, we destroy them by fire. We incinerate them. Um, unless they're part of an ongoing criminal case when we have to retain them as evidence. But if they're generally seized and the case is adjudicated, we destroy them. Any other questions? Do you have any comments to make on the packaging piece, the child-proof packaging piece on page, which is 10, 12, wow. I think? Um, my understanding of 1012 was always, uh, I always understood that to be a provision to protect uh, health in terms of uh, ch ch child access to these products. I'm certainly not a doctor, uh, but my knowledge and experience has told me that, that nicotine in liquid form has a certain toxicity to the human body and that the child resistant packaging provisions were intended to protect uh, public health. Um, I, I see no reason why <clears throat> The adding of the e-liquids wouldn't be uh, pertinent to that same public health viewpoint. Um, although it is important to mention that the definition of e-liquids as, as uh, proposed here would include things not including nicotine, things also like CBD would potentially be uh, included in this definition as it is vaped. Uh, things like THC bearing uh, uh, concentrates would be included and therefore would be required to have this child resistant packaging if it met that definition. I'm not, I'm not testifying if that's a, a negative, I'm just trying to bring that to the attention of the committee. Okay, thank you, that's good. All right, so we'll have to put that into our decision making. All right, is there anything else here from your perspective? Uh, the only thing I would bring up is uh, my, just, just to make the community aware, my office includes uh, 14 investigators, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we handle the regulation and oversight of both alcohol, tobacco, uh, and lottery, and some elements of gambling within the state. Um, I, I, I only bring this up in terms of uh, uh, resource management for my department. This ban would certainly uh, increase uh, the scope and work of which my investigators do. We have around 7,000 active licenses across the state, which 14 investigators uh, operate in three key programs, one being a comprehensive minor compliance program where we send minors into these establishments to try and purchase underage, uh, testing the compliance with the statutes in regards to access to minors. Second would be a regulatory inspection model where we enter these establishments and ensure that they're complying with all laws and regulations. And thirds would, third would be uh, investigations, and those would be things like complaints from the public, uh, regarding violations of law or regulation. Um, this, this certainly adds another layer of uh, enforcement in terms of ensuring, particularly with a flavor ban, um, that many of these products uh, wouldn't be on the shelves. <coughs> I, I only bring that up to say uh, that's a, it's a little bit of a challenge for us resource-wise. Uh, we found means to enforce these access uh, laws in the past, the last session passing the delivery sales ban. We were fortunate to receive some grant funding from the health department to uh, engage in some testing and uh, compliance testing of uh, adherence to the delivery sales ban. Uh, but that is on a very small scale basis. Uh, 
the delivery sales band in particular is a, a wide universe of online retailers and these products. And again, 14 investigators with our mission set. Uh, we, do, we, we are attempting to do the best we can and cover as much ground as we can. We appreciate it. The, the, the other question that's come up from time to time is, uh, you know, uh, Tobacco 21 has now gone into effect for a couple of months, and I'm, the question is, have you seen, do you have any data that shows an effect uh, or not? I do. I'm, I'm pleased to announce, and you'll see a report come from, out from my office at the end of this month, which would be six months since passage. Uh, our minor compliance program testing historically uh, has shown in any six-month period to show about 90% compliance, meaning one out of 10 compliance checks would uh, result in the furnishing of tobacco products to a minor. Since September of last year and the, the passage of Tobacco 21, we've seen almost 5% jump in our compliance. Uh, so we are having far fewer sales of products to minors during our uh, com tobacco compliance testing uh, since the passage of Tobacco 21. Wow, that's really amazing. It, I've never seen anything more than a 2% jump in any six month period, and this is almost a 5% jump. Wow. So then, sorry, go ahead, Senator. Why do you think that is? I think retailers uh, are sensitive to the passage of that. I think, uh, I think they err further on the side of caution with the passage of Tobacco 21 and trying to visually identify the age of the potential buyers. And if they, uh, they just, I think they're scrutinizing our minors much, much more than they'd had in the past. So the sales to minors has dropped significantly, but the, 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 the youth risk sur behavior survey has shown an increase in utilization, so it's tough. Uh, I, yeah. I have no hard data on that, no. uh, but I would believe based on the surveys we've done with the health department funding for our online delivery sales ban, yeah. I, I believe we've uh, shifted uh, access in a certain realm to yeah. online procurement. And, um, mm -hmm. oh boy. Anything else we need to know? Uh, I just, <laughs> just a comment to that. We have the guy in here from Brattleboro that just moved across the river. Right. Now you sell them. So they just, you know. But he sells the tanks, not yeah, the but, but, but there will be other ones. But he's just moved across right. the river, so it's. You know. So the sales are leaving. Right, yeah. And we, we have seen a decline in our number of license, uh, tobacco licenses issued year after year. Uh, when I first started with the department about six years ago, we were generally over 1,000 license, active licenses in the state. Uh, I do believe the last metric I saw, saw we just dipped below 900 licenses. Okay, thank you very much for being here and for working with us. I'm sure that, well, it, it's possible that you'll be going into economic development to look at this with them, so. My pleasure, so, happy to assist. Thank you, and if, if anything else comes up that you think we should know about, please don't hesitate to communicate with us. Absolutely. Can send Dory a note or Jen a note, and we'll try to work together. Absolutely. Thank you. Very well. It's nice to meet you.